If there's small children that don't know that kirtan is over and they want to keep kirtan going. <laughs> Parent, please do the need for Or just general babble and a little boy there is This is part two of a four part incomplete discussion about Grandfather Bhishma. We started Friday evening. a lot of interesting things about Grandfather Bhishma. Just very quickly, he is one of the twelve Mahajans. He is one of the eight Vasus. And um, before he was Bhishma Dev, he had a different name. And his different name is the Devabrata, the son of the eighth child. Uh, Santanu. Yes? Yes. And? Ganga. Ganga. They had come to this material, the earthly plane, from the heavenly plane, because they kind of made a bobo and they became worldly attracted in a way that wasn't so appropriate and so they were cursed to take birth on earth for some time. So, narration we heard. And then we heard so many other things about Grandfather Bhishma. How he became uh, the father of Dhritarash, the Pandu and Vidura. We heard that description from Mahabharata. And you see the image here. So you know what we're going to be speaking about. The Five Arrows story. How many days did the Kurukshet for battle take? 18 days. 18 days. On day number eight of the Kurukshet for battle, Eight out of eighteen. It's not quite half of the Kurukshetra battle was completed. Duryodhana went to the chief general of the Kuru army, Grandfather Bhishma, and lodged a complaint. And her mother name would be called feedback. He lodged a complaint. You're not you're not doing your job. You're the emblem of Dharma. And you're not doing your Dharma. You're the chief general. You're the hero. Nobody can defeat you. My goodness. Even Parashram wasn't able to defeat you. You're just not trying. Because you're not impartial. You're not doing your Dharma. You're partial to the Pandavas. Come on, Grandfather Bhishma. Show us your stuff. Be the general that we know that you're capable of. He took the challenge and said, very well, at the end of day eight, I, who never break my vow, will take a vow right now. See these five arrows? With these five arrows, tomorrow, day nine, I will kill the Pandavas. 
take these arrows when you come back to greet me in the morning as you do each morning to pay your respects. Bring the five arrows with you and that day, tomorrow, I will, with these arrows, kill all five of the Pandavas. And Duryodhana was, yay! <laughs> and Krishna was, boo! <laughs> he is initiate. So he knew exactly what had transpired. So he called Arjuna. It's in the evening after the day's battle. Arjuna, do you remember long ago you saved Duryodhana's life? He was in a battle with a Gandharva and he was being defeated and he would have been killed, but you protected him. You intervened. You defeated the Gandharva. Do you remember Arjuna? And Duryodhana was so indebted to you, he gave you a promise. Anything you like, you name it, it's yours. I take a bow. And remember what you said? No, I don't need anything now. At the right time, I'll ask. Remember, Arjuna? Now it's the time to ask. <laughs> Tonight, before he takes rest, and before he gets up in the morning, go to Duryodhana's tent, remind him of that promise he made to you, and just ask him for the five arrows. He'll know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So he went to Duryodhana's tent, and Duryodhana said, Arjuna, what have you, what, what's, what's the good news? Why have you come? I've, I've come to remind you of a promise that you made very well. Do you want the kingdom? It's yours. No, no, I don't want the kingdom. Just give me those five arrows, please. <laughs> <laughs> sure, here's the five arrows. I, I keep my word. I'm bound by Chatriya codes to keep my word. He gave Arjuna the five arrows, and Arjuna showed the five arrows to Krishna. He was very happy. So the next morning, day nine, Duryodhana comes to pay his respects to Grandfather Bhishma. And Grandfather Bhishma was looking for the five arrows. Where's the, where's the five arrows? Oh. Arjuna came last night and he reminded me of a promise and I had to fulfill my promise and he asked me for those five arrows so I, I can't give them to you. Arjuna has them. So, he who has never broken his vow has had his vow broken. Now, Bhishma made another vow. I, who have never made, broken my vow, take another vow that will not be broken. Today, day nine, before the sun sets, I will slay Krishna's best friend, Arjuna, or Krishna will break his vow. <laughs> Now, I find this, like, really, really lovely. Lovely in the sense that, <clears throat> as you're all experienced folks, you know the Jai Radha song, so you know there's five primary rasas. And Shanta, Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhurya. So which of those five rasas is the rasa of Grandfather Bhishma in relation to Krishna? It's not Madhurya. It's not Shanta, so there's three left. It's Dasya. Although he's grandfather, his mood, I just want to serve Krishna. Is it not a puzzle? 
that grandfather Bhishma, who never breaks his vow, would take a vow that Krishna, he would kill Krishna's dear most friend and devotee. Isn't that a puzzle? Why would he do that? And the answer is, there's, in the science of rasa, those of you that like reading Prabhupada's books, you know, in addition to the five primary, there's seven secondary rasas. And one of those seven secondary rasas is chivalry. And the nature of the secondary rasas is sometimes the secondary rasa becomes so prominent, it's, it's compared to waves, and sometimes one wave becomes so prominent, it overwhelms the other waves and then subsides. Sometimes the secondary rasas become so prominent, it eclipses the primary rasa and it appears to be prominent and then it recedes, but all it's doing is strengthening, enriching, and enhancing the primary rasa. So the secondary rasa, one of them is chivalry. And by the inspiration of the internal potency, Yogamaya, he became inspired by chivalry to give Krishna a tussle. And Krishna liked it very much. It didn't change the primary rasa, but the secondary rasa seemed more prominent, at least for some period of time. That's what was going on in the science of rasa understanding. Now, <coughs> he knew what Krishna would do. He knew that Krishna would break his vow. And what he was demonstrating was Krishna holds something up here that's even greater than his chatriya duty. And that's protection of his devotee. His bhaktavatsala quality is more important than dharma. Swat dharma is more important than this worldly dharma. Dharva dharma paritnyaja mame kam sharanam So if one takes full shelter of Krishna, like Arjuna has, then Krishna will give us protection. Guaranteed. Even if he makes a promise something else. He puts that above everything else. And Krishna's pastime demonstrated. Now, <coughs> we heard Friday evening that <coughs> Bhishma, before he was Bhishma, was Deva Vrata. Deva Vrata was the eighth child of Santanu and Ganga. For 32 years, he was trained in military skill by Parashuram, his military guru, and by Vishishta, who taught him everything about Dharma, and thus he became qualified as one of the principal Mahajans that knows everything about Dharma. He didn't. He followed the procedure that we're supposed to follow. He received teaching from Guru. Both teachings. And when he was 32, Ganga returned Deva Vrata to Santana. Now he has a son who is his eldest son and the next heir to the throne. But, after Ganga, the second wife of Santanu was desiring, he was desiring the hand of who? The princess, the daughter of a fisherman. What's her name? Satyavati. And we heard on Friday about how such of a tea became such of a tea. And it was, it's a long story. And I wanted to do some clarification. This is Bhaktivedanta Purport from Canto 9, Chapter 22, where Prabhupada writes, such of a tea 
was actually the daughter of Vipichara Vasu by the womb of a fisherwoman known as Machya Garbha. Now somebody in our audience, I didn't think anybody would even notice, but somebody, at least one somebody, noticed because they brought it to my attention, that the, the Upachara Vasu narration that I made indicated that the daughter was born of a fish, not a fisherwoman. Those of you who were there on Friday, you remember. An apsara had become cursed. Long narration, which I won't go into. She had become a fish. That in a female fish body, she swallowed, long story, the semen of Vipicharu Vasu, long story, how that happened. And she conceived two children in her fish body. The fish was caught, and when the fisherman who caught the fish opened the fish, he found two humans inside the fish's body, male and female child. The male child, both were given to the king, Upachara Vasu, and Upachara Vasu accepted the male child who became his commander-in-chief and the female child that smelled like a fish was given to the fisher man who caught the fish. And thus, she smelled like a fish and was raised by the fisher man. Doesn't get this name. So someone understood, they listened very carefully and the narration that I just said was Satyavati and her brother were born from a fish. But it, here it says fisher woman. So a little clarification for those of you there on Friday. Maybe you caught it, maybe you didn't. As you know, there are different versions of Ramayana that are authorized. There's Valmiki Ramayana and there's others. And there's different versions of Mahabharata. In addition to um, Yasadeva's Mahabharata, there's other versions. We find one of them being made reference to Brihat Bhagavatamrita, and there's others, etc. So, one of the versions of Mahabharata describes that in addition to the five sons of Upacharabhasu from his queens, from his queen, there's some story we heard about this queen. There was an additional fathering of two children from a fisherwoman. And when the children were born of the fisherwoman, the female child remained in the fishing village group, and she was then trained and became the daughter of the fisherman, who did, you know, the rest of the narration were familiar with. The rest of the narration was she, the daughter of the fisher man, was actually the daughter of Vipicharo Basu. She was given the service of taking people across the river because his, his understanding, his idea, was she may carry one sadhu across the river. The sadhu gives my daughter some blessings. She'll have good fortune in her life. It was a calculated plan. She'll do this and she'll get that. That was his idea. And sure enough, it happened. Parashramoni, etc., etc. So, the fisherman, when Santanu approached the fisherman, the king approached a fisherman to marry his daughter. He said, no. And he said, no, because you already have a firstborn son. The firstborn son will become the king according to our Vedic standards. And my daughter has been blessed that her son will become king. So I'm sorry, 
you can't marry my daughter because her son will become king. And he was heartstruck, etc., etc. When Deva Brata came to know what was the cause of his father's sadness, he went to the fisherman, made his appeal. The fisherman said, No, why not? Because you're going to be the next king and my daughter's son will become the next king. So the answer is no. My daughter can't marry your father. Then he made these two vows, I won't become king. Now can my, can your daughter, no, because if you marry and have a son, then by law, your son will become king if he's born before my daughter's son, so no. Very well, second vow, never marry. And he upheld that vow. And he upheld that vow, even it meant, we're going to hear some more detail. I hope you're ready for Mahabharata stories. Because that's what's going to happen. He fought harsh around for 23 days, simply on the basis of he had to uphold his vow. He who upholds his vow had his vow broken by Krishna by Krishna's tricks. So I'm going to make Krishna break this vow. So, on the ninth day, which was after the ninth morning when he found out that his vow had been broken, and he took the second vow. Krishna ends up protecting Arjuna exactly as was understood by Bhishma, that's what he would do. So from the very outset of the day, Grandfather Bhishma was very, very focused. And if you read in Mahabharata, it's, it's like, it's like Ramayana, just hearing this 23-day 20, battle between the two, Arshram and the, both invincible, both shooting each other, and, collapsing, becoming unconscious, and the other side going, yay, and then they come back again for more battle, and the other one gets hit, and oh, yay, on and on, very, you know, the, the kind of things that little boys love to hear about, they love battle scenes, these many little boys like battle scenes. So there was such a battle and very focused, Grandfather Bhishma was totally focused on shooting arrows to make Krishna break his promise. There's this very interesting description in Brihad Bhagavatamrita, part one, where Nara goes to the Pandavas and says, oh, you're the greatest recipients of the Lord's mercy. And Bhima says, what are you talking about? Krishna is just a tricky person. He never keeps his word. You can't trust him. He says, all these things. And, and Arjuna said, no, no, no. That's just his pastime. But the greatest recipient of Krishna's mercy, do you, you know what it's like? When I'm on the chariot and Krishna's body is receiving arrows that are meant for me, that's merciful, greatest recipient. A lot coming from Krishna's body because of arrows intended for me. How do you think I felt? How old? But Krishna was enjoying, we know from nectar devotion, Krishna was enjoying the arrows of grandfather Bhishma in a very interesting poetic way. Like the bite when the lover bites the beloved. It's not like when somebody bites you, it's like, ouch. It's just a, it's a loving, it's a chivalrous rasa Krishna enjoys. And towards the end of the day, when 
the chariot wheel of Arjuna became stuck and he got down to fix his chariot wheel. Krishna, our grandfather Bhishma was ready to finish him. And seeing this, Krishna picked up the broken chariot wheel of Arjuna and started running full speed. Krishna can go really fast. Faster than the mind, faster than anything. My grandfather Bhishma ready to smash him with Arjuna's chariot wheel. Arjuna didn't want Grandfather Bhishma to be smashed, so he grabbed Krishna around the waist. Who can stop Krishna? And Krishna wants. Who can stop him? And Grandfather Bhishma pictured here, it was <laughs> and just at that time the sun set <laughs> the end of the day that was over Krishna didn't smash him that night the Pandavas had a Pandava bubble and they were considering what to do, what to do, what to do. Grandfather Bhishma was so powerful. They decided to go to Krishna and ask him what to do, what to do. So Krishna said, it's a well-known fact that Grandfather Bhishma will be killed by Sikandi. And he reminded them of the details of what Grandfather Bhishma told the Kurus before the first day of the battle. And here's the detail. This is the Mahabharata detail. Get ready. You ready? You like battle scenes? Yes? Be honest. Yes or no? Yes, okay. Bhishma is narrating to the Kurus, and Krishna reminds. Long ago, Bhishma was a brother of Chitrangada and Vishitavirya. Oh, there because their mother was the same, although their father was different. And To assist his, in the absence of Santanu, he acted like the father of his two brothers, because he was the elder brother. He was making an arrangement for the marriage of the younger of the three brothers, Richard Treviria. And he heard that there was going to be a Swainvar ceremony of the King of Kashi, and the three daughters were being given the privilege by the King of Kashi to choose who their husband would be, and so kings and princes and heroes from all the land came to Kashi and Bhishma decided, I'm going to go too. Taking all his weapons ready for battle, he decided on his way. In addition to waiting for them to choose, there's another option and that's very respected in their Chatriya clan, is I'll kidnap all three. So he reached the place where the Swainvar ceremony was going to be held, and he declared loudly, I am going to take all three daughters of the King of Kashi to marry my younger brother, Vichy Tiberi. Placed them on his chariot, took off. And everyone was shocked. And then after shock wore off very quickly, they became very chivalrous and started chasing Grandfather Bhishma with the three daughters and the chariot and thousands of volleys of his place, you know, battle scene. Thousands of volleys of arrows and the three sisters are... So Grandfather Bhishma stopped so they wouldn't have to worry and he fired so many arrows all the soldiers were either maimed or the horses killed or the chariot disarmed 
And they were all finished except for one. Who was the one? Shalva. Shalva continued to pursue because the detail was there was this romance between Amba and Shalva. And he said to her, and she said to him, and his father and her father, they were like in agreement, and it was the Swaimbar ceremony where she was going to say, I want to marry Shalva. It was already like a done deal. But then here comes Bishma, and he kidnapped him. So he's like, I'm going to rescue my girl, my future wife, my fiance. And Krishna destroyed him. He didn't kill him, but he totally destroyed and defeated him. And carried on all the way back to Hastinapur. And plans were being made for the marriage of the three girls to Vichar Traviria. But then in confidence, you know the story, Amba said, I can't marry Vichar Traviria. I've already given my heart to Shalva. What to do? You're a knower of Dharma. And Bhishma said, I have to consult the Brahmanas. You know when you consult Brahmanas, you're going to get different opinions, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened, different opinions and different opinions. And finally, they, you know, one, one point they agreed on is she should go back and marry Shalva. So, Bhishma consented, thought it was a very good idea, arranged for some brahmanas and some ministers and some military to give her a royal escort back to Shalva's kingdom. And when she reached there, this is Bhishma narrating, he said, sorry, I can't marry you. You've been touched by another man. I have to follow the codes of Dharma. And although you've given your heart to me, and etc., etc., I can't. So she tried to persuade him in ways that females know how to help persuade a male, and he wouldn't budge. And he said, "You, you go back to Austin." She felt totally betrayed. You know, there's a saying in Shakespeare that says, hell knows no fury like a woman scorned. Don't scorn a woman, for those. <laughs> Even if you're banned by the beach, don't lose. <laughs> so she couldn't go back to Hustin or she didn't want to go back to her father because of embarrassment and shame. That's like, we learned this the other day, so at the, the, the bottom of the pyramid of negative emotion is shame. She felt totally ashamed. She didn't know what to do. So she just decided she would go perform austerities to overcome whatever it was that's in her past that was the cause of this misfortune so she can become the lead of that misfortune. And her austerities were long in duration and pretty severe. And she requested shelter at the residence of some sages that were also doing austerities. And it was a little odd to have a lady in their ashram, but they permitted and she was very determined. And one of those sages that was visiting that ashram, Hotra Bahara, this is Bhishma narrating this history. Dr. <coughs> Bahanamuni heard the whole story from her and he took pity. Compassion is natural for a saintly person. He said, the only thing I can think in your situation is somebody more powerful than Bhishma has to convince Bhishma to do the right thing. And actually, Bhishma is the one that violated you. Bhishma should marry you. I'm going to go see my friend, Prashramuni. 
excuse me, Parashuram. And it turns out, according to at least one Mahabharata version, coincidentally, providentially, Parashuram was going to visit that ashram the next day. So the whole story was told. He considered this way, that way, the other way, lots of details of his contemplations, what is the right thing. His dharma is a little tricky sometimes. So he said, um, you know, he was a brahmana. And he said, I, I can't just, he's my student. They can't just go smash him or, but if there's a brahmana that makes a request of me, then I'll be obliged. So they went on and on and talking, back with lots of pages of contemplations of what's right, what is to be done, what's not, Mahabharata kind of conversation. And one Brahmana said, you must help her. I said, okay, that's all I needed was one Brahmana giving me some instruction. So I'm going to go straight to Hastinapur and demand that Vishnu does the right thing. She's in this situation because of your conduct. You have to correct the situation. Either you marry her or you fight me. So then there's this interesting discussion about standards by which the instruction of a guru may not be taken up. And there's three circumstances. It's the detailed in Mahabharata if you read in Krishna Dharma is it's really just one sentence. It's detailed in Mahabharata. If he becomes sensually out of control, if he continues to, to violate standards of Dharma or if he gives an instruction that's against the, the cause of Dharma, he says, Oh, I've taken a vow. And by all means, I must have pulled my vow. That's a Chatriya code. And you're asking me to violate my Chatriya code. Besides, she's given her heart to another man. How can, how can I become married to a woman who's given her heart to another man? So if you're giving me this choice, then there's only one thing. Let's meet in battle. And for me, there'll be no sin incurred because I'm, I'm following this instruction, not that one. See in Kurukshetra. Let's go to a holy place so when you leave your body, you go to, you go to heaven. So they went to Kurukshetra. Ganga comes and tries to intervene and persuade both. It's like long discussion. Neither of them are ready to hear Ganga persuade them to not fight. The fighting goes on. Detail, those boys that like details of fun. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. You're a boy, right? <laughs> this mic. Uh, long description. Both are feeling exhausted. Two heroes equal valor, neither can defeat the other. There's some detail where uh, eight Brahmanas come and instruct Vishma, continue, you will be victorious. Narada has informed us, continue, you will be victorious. So he continues, and the next day, on the battlefield, Jamadagni comes and instructs Parshuram, he's one of the Basus, you're not going to defeat him, just drop your weapons, end this. So following the instruction of his formidical father, he drops his weapons, and the battle's over, Oh, Bhishma comes and pays his obeisances before Parshuram and appeals to him to for victory. I, that I shall slay you. Let me be victorious. Please give me your blessing. Anyway, 
with all this interesting. And so the battle's over. Parashram cannot defeat Bhishma, who's standing for his word, for his vow. And so Parashram goes and says to uh, Amba, I tried. I wanted to give you protection, but Bhishma is invincible. And besides, my father instructed me to stop, so I tried. And she appreciates, but she's now really ramped up. I, I gotta get revenge. If he can't, then I need power that I can. I will destroy Bhishma. So she undergoes extreme asceticism. It's like this amazing. It's it's it's, it's intense asceticism even beyond what Dhruva did. And she did it for twelve years. Whew. And one of those places that she was doing her asceticism was in the Ganga and, and Mother Ganga comes and asks her, What are you doing? And she tells her explicitly, I'm doing, I'm undergoing austerity so I can get power so I can kill your son. <laughs> very, very correct. Very determined. And Ganga speaks some words. Oh, daughter of the king of Kashi, uh, your intentions are vile. And although you have, you are you have become powerful, you're growing with some effulgence, you continue like this and your body will dissolve and become a river filled with alligators and crocodiles and poisonous fish. So be it, she says, and she continues her austerities. So half of her body turns into a river flowing in this place called Vatsa Bhumi, and she, with the other half of her body, she continues. This particular river is known that during certain seasons it flowed and it's filled with crocodiles and dangerous fish, and it dries up. So, with her half a body, she continues. And the rishis in the place, they see the determination of Amba. And they approach her and give her some advice after hearing her story. They say, you need to go to Lord Shiva and he'll take care of you. So at once she begins her intense worship of Lord Shiva, who appears before her after some time. What is it you wish? I want to have the power to kill people. So he says, very well. In your next life, you will be able to kill Bhishma. But you'll be born first as a woman, and then you'll become a man, and you'll be able to kill Bhishma. She said, great. She built a fire, jumped in the fire. Raised her own death so that she could be born to kill Bhishma. This is Bhishma telling the story. He knows the whole history. And then he tells the history of King Drupada. Now, Drupada, Drupada is famous for being the father of Draupadi. And who was the twin? Dhritarashtra? Dhritarashtra? Yes, Dhritarashtra. From that fire. But before those two were born, he was childless, and he and his wife were advised similar to Amba, worship Lord Shiva, so they worship Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva appeared, and Lord Shiva gave them a benediction. You will have a child, a male child, but first the male child will be born as a female child, but don't worry. <coughs> the female child will become a male child and you'll have a son. So with faith, 
And Lord Shiva, sure enough, they had a female child. And they named the female child Shikandi. And they trained the female child as if the female child was a male. They did all the training of military skill of this and that and the other thing. And then eventually Sikhanti came to be of marriageable age in the body of a woman who, according to Lord Shiva, will become a man. So being religious parents, they wanted to have their child married. So what to do because female body, but they had faith in the words of Lord Shiva. So they somehow made an arrangement with another king who had a prince, a son, King Haranyavarma, who was the king of the Dasharnaka kingdom, to marry his son. And everything was great until they actually got married in the night of their marriage. The son of the king realized he was married. <laughs> Excuse me. The daughter of the king was married to a woman. I did it wrong. It was a princess. So this king Hranya Varma was furious and he marked his entire army to destroy King Drupada and his kingdom. And when this took place, poor Shikandi who was in a female body, married to another woman who was supposed to be a man, went to the forest and said, I'm the cause of all this trouble, I'm just going to give up my life, and was undergoing great austerities, and by providential arrangement, the Yaksha of the name Stuna came across Sikandi, undergoing his austerities, ready to fast until death. He asked her, what's the problem? She told the whole story, and the Yaksha Stuna said, oh, I'd like to do something to help you, but the only thing I can think of is I can trade you my manhood for your womanhood, but you're going to have to come back after some time and you know, change back again. So Sikhandi said, fantastic. You have my womanhood, I'll take your manhood. And, he, and now he, Sikhandi, went back to King Drupad's kingdom as the son of King Drupad. And when the king, Hiranya Varma, came with his army, King Drupad's messenger said, before you start the battle, guess what? <laughs> See, and he's a male. Oh, my daughter said it was female. So some girls were assigned to go check Sikhandi out, and sure enough, he's male. So the battle didn't take place, everyone became happy, except uh, Yaksha Stuna had a problem. <laughs> because the head of the Yaksha group is who? Kovera. Kovera came across, where's Stuna? And he was in hiding because he was no longer he, it was, he was a she. <laughs> and Yuck, and Kovera came to find out that he cursed him. You stay like this. What have you done? He said, you're an embarrassment for the whole Yaksha dynasty. And the other Yaksha said, well, he was trying to help out Shikandi and give him a break. <laughs> so Kuvera made it a little reprieve. Okay. When Sikandi dies, then Sikandi can come back and give yeah, her his manhood back to Stuna who can take again the womanhood from Stuna and everything would be nice. So this was all narrated by Bhishma before the battle, saying, it has been prophesied that Sikandi will kill me. It's, it's well-known, you know, folktale, but it's true. 
So when the time of battle comes and Sikhandi is on the other side, I will not fight. So at the end of day nine, this is after this intense thing between Krishna and Arjuna and Bhishma breaking Krishna's vow, the, uh, the Pandavas went to the chariot of Grandfather Bhishma and said, what can we do to defeat you? He said, I've already told everybody, you just put Sikhandi on the battlefield in front of me and it's over. That's all you have to do. Be very liberal. <laughs> so that's what they did. They put Sikhandi in the front line. And Grandfather Bisha wouldn't fight. And Sikhandi, because Sikhandi is the, is the son of Drona, and Drona is fighting on the side of the Pandavas. Sikhandi shot arrows that pierced the body of Grandfather Bhishma. And that ends the life of Grandfather Bhishma, except that Grandfather Bhishma, when he took this terrible vow, because that's the meaning of his name, his father, Santanu, he wasn't an ordinary person, as we heard on Friday evening. Previously, he was a demigod who was cursed to take birth on earth. He had powers. So he gave the power of benediction to his son, Deva Vrata, now called Bhishma Dev. You don't have to give up your body until you choose. So Bhishma Dev decided to wait. Although he probably has some pain. He was able to transcend his pain by in the bed of arrows for a particular moment, which we're going to be discussing this evening at the Detroit Temple. Part three, the passing of Grandfather Bhishma. That's what we'll be discussing this evening. And the whole scene that's now the chapter nine of Canto One Shrimad Bhagavatam. Really fantastic chapter. If you like reading Kalpa's books, it, it may be one of your favorite chapters. There's some other ones that are also favorite chapters, but it's a really special chapter. And we'll be discussing the beginning part this evening and then continuing later on this week.